How are those New Year's resolutions looking as we head into early March? Are you dialed in, consistently integrating the new habits and routines you promised would become a reality in your life this year? Or have you hit roadblocks and started thinking you just don't have what it takes? What if I were to tell you there's a solution, a simple way to turn your goals into reality? Today's guest does exactly that, and he has the research to back it up. Welcome to the latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Cooper, the Catalyst Coaching Institute, and today's hidden gem features Stanford University's world-renowned behavioral scientist, Dr. B.J. Fogg, author of the international bestseller, Tiny Habits. Dr. Fogg and I met at a conference where we were both speaking, and I knew that day he would be an incredible source of evidence-based practical strategies for our Catalyst community. It took two years to get the interview scheduled, but I think you'll agree it was worth the wait. On the coaching front, there is still time to join us for the upcoming kickoff of the latest NBHWC-approved health and wellness coaching certification. And if you're already a coach, don't miss your opportunity to join us for the coaching event of the year, the Rocky Mountain Coaching Retreat and Symposium in beautiful Estes Park, Colorado this September. Details for both the certification and the retreat are available at CatalystCoachingInstitute.com or we're happy to discuss it with you. Just email us results at CatalystCoachingInstitute.com. We'll set up a time to chat. Now, let's tune in to how we can use tiny habits to truly be a catalyst on the latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast. Well, Dr. Fogg, it is a, it's a huge pleasure to have you. We've been working on this a long time. I, I am so thrilled to have the chance to chat with you here. Let's just, out, out of the gate, let's look back before we go forward. How did you come about studying habit formation in the first place? Was, was it something you'd grown up curious about? Was there a turning point in your career that kind of pointed you that direction? Walk, walk us through that path a little bit. It's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly, but I certainly grew up in a culture and a family that valued uh, being productive, uh, creating good habits, uh, continual improvement. I grew up in a Mormon home in California. And so think Steve Covey, think sure. Marriott, yeah. think Mitt Romney, yeah. uh, think Clay Christensen, all Mormons. All, and there's probably not an accident, you know, that Stephen Covey and Clay Christensen uh, you know, we're Mormons. And then I, with that background, I'm not a practicing more now, but certainly grew up in that, uh, culture. And so there certainly were things around goal setting. And, and of course the religion has these behavioral restrictions, but also these behaviors that you do, you okay. fast once a month, uh, teenagers go to early morning church every morning and so on. And so I think I was just tapped into that. Um, but fast forward to college, I got very interested in language and the power of language to influence and persuade. I started a newspaper along with my friends as an undergraduate, grew the circulation of 25,000 people. Wow. Just a newspaper where nobody got paid except for the ad reps and saw the power uh, and the importance of being able to um, talk about issues and we weren't really an activist publication, but sorta. And then got interested in rhetoric, uh, Aristotle, the sophists, and so on. And then I put kind of two and two together. It's like, oh my gosh, this kind of thing is going to come to computers someday. And that's what I did my doctorate. And I was exploring how computers might someday be used to influence attitudes and behaviors. Mm. Fast forward, uh, started a research lab at Stanford on that then shifted gears in about 2009 or 10 away from looking at technology and persuasion just toward human behavior and especially health behavior and health habits. So that's, I guess, in some ways, that would be the trajectory with really the background. And I'll, I guess I'll emphasize the Mormon upbringing. There really is a very strong sense in that culture that you're here on this planet to serve others and help others. And also where much is given, much is expected. Mm. And I don't think that's unique to Mormonism, right. but right. certainly I grew up with that sense of service, service projects. It's the most important thing you can do is serve others. And then you are expected to share and give the things that were given you. Yes. 
whether it's through education or opportunities or just natural gifts. Wow. Love that. Love that. Um, okay. So you note in your book, Tiny Habits, great book that change, and this is going to surprise people. Change doesn't have to be, shouldn't be hard. I mean, I, I read that and I went, Oh, now wait a minute, doc. That, that seems to run contrary to everything we hear, everything we, we, you know, New Year's resolutions coming up, et cetera. Tell us more. What, what do you mean? It doesn't have to be hard. It shouldn't be hard. Yeah. You know, and, and what I want to do very early in the book and early here talking to you is establish the fact that there are ways to change that can be easy. They can be fun. It can be delightful. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be drudgery. You don't even have to tap into willpower in order to change. Wow. And that flies in the face of so much. It does. Flies in the face of there is an academic paper and I won't name names. Um, but you could, people could probably find it. The first sentence is behavior change is hard, period. Wow. That's sometimes true, but not entirely true. We change our behavior all the time in that's not hard. So certain types of behavior change are hard. Yes. But there are types of change and ways to change that are not hard. And that's part of what I want to establish early in the book. And it's like, welcome. You found what I think is the best method for creating habits. And it's not about willpower. It's not about enduring uh, unpleasant things. It's about doing, helping yourself do what you want to do and wiring in the habits by feeling successful. In other words, positive emotion rather than guilt or shame or uh, feelings of being, you know, not, not uh, achieving effectively. Now you started off talking about your upbringing and some of the things with that maybe not in your household or, or your church specifically, but oftentimes there is guilt, there is shame tied to those expectations. Do you want to walk us down that path at all or chase that rabbit trail a little bit? Um, well, let me just share one example. Um, I was probably about 11 or 12. And I remember my dad coming in and saying, okay, well, what are your goals for this year? And what are your, your what's your five-year plan? And <laughs> Wait, my son is laughing now because I, I probably did that with him, if not our daughters. Yeah, right. And, and, and you know, th- this would be kind of normal in our home or, you know, and my dad's awesome. I talked to him this morning. He's a huge fan of my work. But, um, you know, we had like regular meetings, individual meetings with my dad and you set goals. And, and it was cool. I love that. But I guess I just had it up to here with that kind of stuff. And I said, Dad, this year I have one goal, just one goal. And it's not to have any goals. <laughs> I'm hearing my three kids all saying that right now. So you're 11 at the time. About. I mean, oh, I my young. God. I That's young. so funny. I, and I wasn't like a cranky teenager or whatever. I was just like exhausted <laughs> with this continual <laughs> self-improvement thing, I guess. And, and really, there was this. And I think it hurt me later. I mean, there's so many things that helped me in that regard. But it hurt me later to always feel like I had to be constantly improving mm. in Mormonism. There is a concept of perfection that you're working toward becoming perfect. That really caught up to me, I think as an undergraduate and realizing I would never sure. reach that ideal. And right. I think I ended up in therapy because of that. Interesting. In part because of that. Sure. Now I'm over that very much and I embrace imperfections. And I think that's how you really learn and grow and in the tiny habits method, you don't have to be perfect. That's part of it. It's you're discovering what works for you. And if it works, you keep going. If it doesn't, you redesign it. Right. And if you find you actually don't want the habit, you just set it aside. None of those things were things that were taught to me. I mean, I, I was taught in the traditional way. Set a goal, right. track it daily, never fail, you know, um, and then raise the bar. Right. I do not advocate any of those things today. I do not advocate goal setting. I do not advocate perfection. I do not advocate tracking. If it helps you do it, but those things are optional. They're not required to change your behavior or change your life. They're optional. Very interesting. Okay. So I'm going to skip one of the questions I'd plan because I want to dive into this further. You, you talk about the importance of picking a goal. that's important to you personally versus as we just talked about something you feel obligated to do. That really resonates with the coaches listening to this. Why is that so important? Yeah, you know, it's one of the key ideas for my book. And if people don't read my book, remember this sentence. Coaches, what you want to do is help 
people do what they already want to do. And I call that maxim number one. There are two maxims I talk about in the book. So you're really helping people create habits they already want and reach aspirations that they want. Yes. Not that you want for them and not that their spouse wants or their parents want. When you help people do what they already want to do, then the challenge of keeping people motivated, then the challenge of keeping people motivated is diminished. Yeah. You know, if they already want. Right. It's off the table. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's times when our motivation still wavers, but what you're doing is you're tapping into what they're already motivated to do. And that's why when I read a sentence like behavior change is hard, it's like, well, yeah, if you're trying to get people to do stuff they don't want to do, when does that ever become a habit? When does it ever become a habit when, you know, getting people to do stuff they don't want to do? I mean, they might do compliance. Right and do it regularly because they're complying, but compliance is different than automaticity and habits. Right, right, good, excellent. All right, so prompts, the idea of prompts plays a huge role in the approach that you talk about with habit formation. What are, what are some common prompts you might suggest or you've seen utilized across a range of habit changes? Well, I'll start with what you don't use. In okay. the tiny habits method, you don't use post-its, you don't use alarms. See, I'm using little visuals mm. here. You don't use notifications on the phone. That's the old fashioned way. And yes, you can, I call those context prompts. There's things in your environment that prompt you to do stuff. And there are times you use those, but not for habits. You do use those for tasks and one-time behaviors. Okay. Where for habits and the tiny habits method, the prompt is a behavior you already do, an existing routine that reminds you to do the new habit. So many, many people start the coffee maker in the morning. Okay, you already have that routine. You can use that to remind you to do a new habit. So in the tiny habits approach, the recipe, and we call this a recipe, it goes like this, after I, I will. So after I start the coffee maker, I will do three push-ups against the kitchen counter for example, mm-hmm. or it could be after I start the coffee maker, I will open up my journal. So you're, you're finding where this new habit, whether it's push-ups or writing your journal, mm. what does it come after in your life? And so you don't have the annoyance of post-it notes or alarms or whatever, as, because you're designing it into your existing routine. You're finding what it comes after. And I call that an action prompt as opposed to a context prompt, which is like alarms and post-its and things like that. And those kinds of prompts are not annoying. Those kinds of prompts don't overwhelm us. It turns out that if you can find where a new habit like journaling or push-ups fits naturally in your existing routine, that habit can form really quickly. And then it feels seamless. It feels like, oh my gosh, that's what I always do. I always start the coffee maker and do like three counter Mm push-ups. I always then sit down and open my journal. And for the person who's hearing that and saying, Oh, I I really like that. But I, when I start the coffee maker, I suddenly get into my race through the day. Are there, are there ways then to say, well, then we need to find a different place for that habit Uh, or. Exactly. And thank you. Okay. Thank you for your guidance on this. Yeah. So you design that tiny habit recipe after I start the coffee maker, if it doesn't fit there, look for another Mm. place where journaling might fit. It might be after you sit down with your coffee at the kitchen table. So then you just revise it. And in the tiny habits method, there's no shame in revising. Mm. Good. I mean, I started teaching the method uh, actually ended up being thousands of people a year. It was hundreds of people a week, week after week on email personally And one of the things I started saying in 2011 is when I started teaching this in the five-day course that still exists and it's still free and it will always be free is practice and revise. Practice and revise. Notice there's not a lot of planning. Notice you're not reading academic papers or thinking about it. It's like practice, dive in, and then revise. So revision is an important part of the method. So if Doing push-ups doesn't fit after starting the coffee maker. Look for another place 
where it does fit naturally. So you're looking for the natural fit. And there are criteria and for the coaches we train and certify in tiny habits. We go deep into this. How do you help people? Because you're pairing the new habit with something you already want to do in the, the recipe. And there are criteria that make that success. So I'll just share one of them. Okay. Location. If the new habit is something you have to do in the garage, don't pair it with the behavior you do in the bathroom. Because what I've learned over the years of coaching this, that does not work. If it's after I brush my teeth, I will tidy one thing in the garage. It's not going to become a habit because it's not the same location. Interesting. Other things too, but it's part of the, the skill of this is like, here's the new habit I want. One skill is how do I make it super tiny? And we'll talk about that probably later, why that matters. And then where does this fit in my routine? And the more you practice, the better you are just like any kind of design, the more you practice, the better you are, and you won't always be perfect. And then when it doesn't work, well, you just revise. You look for another place. Uh, maybe. Yes. So let's throw an example in, and, and I'll use myself in this, but it probably is something that a lot of our listeners are saying, yeah, me too, Brad. Journaling. I'm a huge believer in journaling. I think it's a great idea. It's done. It's been a positive thing when I've done it, but I don't do it in the morning because that's my workout time. And then I pop into work and I'm, you know, going all in. And then I have talked about, well, I'll do it at the end of my day. Well, I'm so engrossed in what I'm doing that the end of my day runs out. And th so yeah. what approach might you suggest in that type of situation? Bam. So where I would start with that, and this is a familiar one, is think about Rather than where it fits, first think about the habit itself, journaling. So that's okay. an abstraction. There's at least a dozen ways we sure. can journal. Okay. And so pick a really pick a form that you want to do. Uh, if you don't want to handwrite, then maybe it's typing. If you don't want to do either of those, maybe it's talking. Okay. So again, it goes back to help yourself do what you already want to do, or coaches help. Other people do right. what they want to do and then make it really, really simple and easy. So it could be in the case of journaling, rather than actually writing anything, it's maybe just opening the journal as the habit. So the habit is just open the journal. Now you have to find some, even though you make the habit super tiny, it's got to be meaningful. And for some people, opening a journal may not be meaningful, so maybe it's just open the journal and write one word and put a period after it. Bam. And then if you want to do more, terrific. Do more, but you don't have to. Hmm. So all you do is you open it, you write one word like exhausted, period, or baffled, period, or energized, period, or confused, or whatever it is. Right. And if that's all you do, that's you you celebrate that and move on. So 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 first it's you take the habit. Pick the form of it you want, make it super tiny. Then it's like, well, where does this fit? And where can I actually do this very reliably? And then it's a design process like we talked about. And try some spot. And if it works, keep going. And if it doesn't, try a different Revise spot. it. Practice and revise. Very good. And, and, right. and so that reminds me of, of a technique with exercise I've heard many people use of just put your shoes on and walk to the bottom of the driveway. If that's, if that's all you do that day that's okay. You know, and I know to people, for people who haven't done that, it's going to sound crazy, but the tiny habits approach for walking where people just put on their walking shoes, so that's a habit and you can stop. You don't have to walk. Right. Right. You're not committing to a mile. People, so many people think, well, that's not helpful. Well, guess what? <laughs> people who have done it, so many people report to me, it's like, oh my gosh, it totally worked yeah. because once I had my shoes on, right. Of course I'm going walking, mm -hmm. you know, so, but if they thought I have to go walk for 30 minutes or an hour, they'd say, can't do right. it today. Right. You know, so it's almost like either you're tricking yourself into the bigger behavior or you're baby stepping right. yourself. It's probably both. Some combination. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's go the other end now. The old saying, go bigger home, go home, or the big, hairy, audacious goal that, that kind of flies in the, the face of what you're talking about. Do you get pushback about, well, Dr. Fogg, you know, I need it to be a big goal or I'm just not motivated to do this thing. Yes and no. I get pushback from people that are inexperienced okay. in changing behavior. 
I get like em warm embraces through email these days from people who are experienced either in changing their own behavior or others. Um, people, <laughs> in some ways, I guess, because here's this, you know, behavior scientist from Stanford saying the go big or go home thing is unreliable. Don't try it. Somehow, I think it, they go, oh God, somebody <laughs> I'm off the it. hook. Some, some finally said it. Now, there are times when you go big. There are times when you stretch yourself. But those are special times and for special things. But as a regular practice to make progress on bringing habits into your life, tiny is the way to go. Tiny is how you succeed and the tiny is how you um, achieve big things. So I, I, I don't want to be dismissive of the people that are inexperienced in creating habits because that's most people in the world. And over the years, I've gotten emails from people that have said, yeah, BJ, you know, or Dr. Fogg. I mean, people can call me BJ. I'm very <laughs> casual. Um, I need big changes in my life. So despite all this about tiny habits and all the successes, I need big change. And so I have a standard email. Whoops, I should have noted that. But I have a reply. <laughs> it basically says, look, the way that you get to big changes is through these tiny changes. Yeah. That's how you get to the big. And some people, I think, believe me, and some people don't. I mean, I don't have like a statistical way to sure. measure the response to that email. But it's a little bit, oh, what shall I say, sad for me that, it, that at least some of those people I'm trying to help are just locked into this idea that in order to make a big transformation, I have to focus on big habits. That makes me sad because they've been misled or they just just haven't really opened their minds to the importance of how tiny can be transformative. And that's really what my book's about right there, showing people how that works and how to do it. Is there some combination there? I'm almost hearing you saying, yeah, the, the big vision is a separate thing. That's not the habit. The big vision, the yeah. You know, the going to Stanford, the qualifying for the Hawaii Ironman, the writing a book, whatever, that vision can have value, but the habits that get you to achieve that are the tiny habits. Would that be accurate or am I miss saying that? That is well said. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so there is a method in behavior design in the book here where you, and, and I'm doing this, if you can't see people, <laughs> I'm drawing a cloud with my fingers. That's where you put your aspiration. Like, I want to be an expert surfer, or I want to be good enough at playing this musical instrument that I can play, you know, on the street corner and make enough money to buy lunch, or I want to lose 30 pounds or whatever, right? right? So that's the aspiration or outcome. And that's not the behavior or the habit. It's right. habits that get you there. Right. So get clear on what you want and definitely think big. If you want to be an expert surfer in Maui, Awesome. You can do that uh, and work toward that, but figure out what are the behaviors, or in other words, the habits. Habits are a subset of behavior. Right. Often it's habits that get you to the big thing. So figure out what are those habits and then follow the process that we've talked about so you can make reliable and consistent progress toward that big vision that right. you have for yourself. For right. Sure. Love it. All right. Very good. Um, you point to the emotion we attach to a pursuit as being even more important than the repetition built into a pursuit. That's pretty interesting. Can you expand on that a little bit for us? Yes. I don't know how far you want to go with this. <laughs> I've got all the time in the world, my friend. <laughs> I'll be brief. And you can, um, so most people have heard the idea that repetition creates habits. Yeah. 21 days, 30, day, 30 days, 66 days. All of that is not true. Correct. So everybody... Try to throw it out, that, try to scrub it out of your memory banks. Um, but it's all around you. Um, and the research most people are citing these days, you can look it up. It's Lally 2009, L A L L Y 2009. Go search it. And even reading the abstract of that paper, you will see that research does not support the idea that emotion. That that research does not support the idea that repetition creates habits, but that's what's widely cited. That's right. where the 66-day thing came from and so on. That study shows that repetition correlates with habit strength, 
but it doesn't show that it causes mm. the habit to form. There's a big difference between correlation and causation. Huge. And the study wasn't even designed to show causality, but the headlines written from it and the blog posts and some books have doubled and tripled down on the doc idea that you just have to keep repeating it to create the habit. That's not the case. That would be like, let me give you an analogy. I could do research that to understand how do people get fit? And let's say that I, I do this study and I find, wow, the more time you spend in the gym, the more fit people are. Okay, I could show there's a correlation between time at the gym and fitness. Now, the headlines might be, oh my gosh, people, if you want to be fit, just go hang out at the gym. <laughs> just spend time at the gym. And you see how that's not working. Sure, that's sure. That's not true. You could right. be hanging out. Read Saturday. a magazine. It's great. Exactly. But that's, what's, that's a direct analogy to this study. So it's really misleading and really unfortunate, I think, and harmful to perpetuate the idea that repetition creates habits, just like it would be harmful to perpetuate the idea that spending time at the gym leads to fitness. It's what you do at the gym. It's what happens when you do the habit. And the happening part that creates the habit is the emotion that you feel. So the emotion that you feel when you do the habit, and in tiny habits, we focus on the feeling of success that's what causes the behavior to become more automatic. So I have a chapter where I explain this in more depth and the headline, the chapter title is emotions create habits. And I did that to be very, very clear and deliberate that it's not anything else. It's not magic. It's not fairy dust. It's not repetition. It's emotions that create the habit, good habits and bad habits all form in the same way. It's emotion and habits can form very, very quickly if you do a behavior and have a strong positive emotion associated with that behavior, it's not 66 days and it's not even in tiny habits in the five day program. Most people report that the end of five days, one of the three habits they practiced became automatic or mm. very automatic wow. within five days. Powerful. And that's not just unusual people. That's right. week after week after week since 2011. I've seen that in my data. So what we're trying to help people get good at and you as coaches uh, and advisors and so on, what you're really doing when you're helping people create habits, if you want them to wire in the habit, help them feel successful. That's maxim number two. <laughs> so mac maxim number one is help people do what they already want to do. Maxim number two is help people feel successful because it helps wire in the habit and it also increases their motivation. But We'll set that aside for now. The, the role of emotions in this context of behavior change is to help wire the habit in so you do it more automatically. And if you're really good at feeling a positive emotion, and there's ways to hack that. So part of the book is teaching people how do you hack that emotion so you can become like a, uh, so you can have superpowers. In creating habits. So if you're good at that, you can wire in habits very quickly. Could you give us a, a simple example of that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example that happened quite naturally. Um, here on our Lanai, I'm in Maui. So the, you poor so guy. The example, the surfing example wasn't <laughs> random. I'm here not becoming an expert surfer, but just enjoying surfing. Um, we first bought these these hardware chairs. We first bought these chairs from the hardware store from Lanai, and they were okay. But then one day, I got this chair that sort of rocks, and I like rocking. I like movement. I guess I, um, you know, like the feeling of, I don't know, being on the ocean or something. And I sat. I put the chair in the Lanai. I sat down. I was like, Oh my god! It was, it it was delivering what I wanted so much better than the chair from the hardware store. And that emotion, so sitting in the chair and feeling like, oh my gosh, this is comfortable. It's got this nice movement. That was clear to me that I was being more successful achieving what I wanted in that chair. Guess how many times I sat in the, um, the Home Depot chair from then forward? Never. I'm going to go well, zero. Yeah. Yeah. Like zero. Right. Yeah. Except for when guests came over, sure. when guests came over, I say, Hey, sit in that chair. Sure. It's really nice. I'm going to sit over here. So notice that was a one and done. I do a behavior. I get this emotional 
response to it. And then I never make a decision again between the Home Depot chair and this other chair that had some movement to it. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And then the final piece, and this has got to affect the emotion, is the celebration. Any tips on types of celebrations, ways to integrate those celebrations, creative ones that you've seen or you've used over the years that maybe people haven't ever thought about? Well, celebration is the term in tiny habits that I selected to um, point to something that you do that causes you to feel successful. So celebration is a technique for feeling, for, for causing this emotion to happen. Some, sometimes the celebration is built in to the product, like the chair or this pen. Say I really, I use this pen for the first time and I love it. It's like, oh my gosh. So I don't have to do anything external or extrinsic. The use of the pen makes me go, I love this. I'm not using any of the other pens anymore. I'm just going to use this one. It's a true story. (laughs) So sometimes, and this is often how bad habits form. You do something and you get an Mm. emotional response to it. Now you didn't celebrate, but the emotion happened. And so that habit that you eventually would call a bad habit wires in quite automatically. Good habits and bad habits form in the same way. So in tiny habits, you don't leave the emotions to chance. You hack them through celebration And I'm going to give you two ends of the continuum. Okay. Some people are natural celebrators. Watch if we were having the Olympics this year. Imagine what would happen when somebody wins, you know, the hundred meter dash. What would happen? Oh, Caleb Dressel just set the world's record today for the hundred IM. That's not the Olympics. And I didn't watch the end of the race. I watched the beginning, but I guarantee you when he finished, there was a type of celebration. He probably hit the water, raised his hands over the head and so on. So watch athletes, they're natural celebrators. What I'm hypothesizing that they've done that naturally since they were kids. And because they were able to celebrate or feel successful with that three point shot, that putt, that drive, that swim, whatever it was, that they were able to signal to their brain, oh my gosh, let's make that more automatic. So when I'm in the clutch, I don't have to think about the three-pointer. It's just automatic. Mm. So that's on one end of the spectrum is people that are natural celebrators. I haven't determined what percent of the population are. I know there are some because some people hearing this or some people are probably going, oh my gosh, I do that. I do that naturally. On the other end of the spectrum are people that are very skeptical of that. They're like, oh, no way. That just sounds like woo-woo. That's, you know, I, I share in the book how to help people like that, you know, get over that and find a celebration that works for you. So if you're a natural celebrator more along those lines, you could do something like a smile in the mirror, a fist pump. Um, I'll say to myself, way to go beach. When I catch a particularly hard wave in a way, like there's a way that the wave's coming and I turn very quickly and get on it at the last minute, I'll go, woohoo, right? Which is <laughs> what works for me. Right, right, right. right. Absolutely. Because then that behavior becomes more automatic. And then that kind of thing no longer is a challenge. And then I step up and do harder things. Um, Now, if that kind of thing doesn't work for you, try the celebration of thinking about your purpose. So, So just actively, so as you pour a glass of water, say you want to hydrate more. And the tiny version of that is just pour a glass of water. As you're filling the glass of water, think how is hydration helping you achieve a super important purpose in your life, like your life's purpose. Uh, I think my life's purpose is to discover how behavior works and teach people that so they can be happier and healthier. So if I had that in mind as I was pouring a glass of water, I would connect, wow, this hydration is gonna give me energy and it's going to give me stamina and it's going to keep me healthier so I can be more effective at discovering how behavior works and teaching it. So connecting the behavior with my higher purpose. Notice that's also a form of feeling successful. Right. By doing this, I'm succeeding in my higher purpose. So that's on, you know, for people that are skeptical about going woohoo or whatever, try connecting your purpose with the habit and actively think of it. Now, once the habit wires in, once pouring the water or doing the counter push-ups, or opening the journal, 
wires in, you no longer have to celebrate it. The emotion is to lock that. I mean, it's, I, I think of it as I used to work in fiberglass and there's kind of a fixer. You pour in the fixer and it solidifies. That's what you're doing with this. That's what you're doing with emotions is you're wiring in the habit. And once it's wired in, it doesn't hurt you to celebrate, but it's no longer, uh, it's, I mean, the habits right. are now automatic. So Tomorrow's you don't have lot. to do it anymore. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. That's helpful. Um, all right. If you were to add a new chapter to the book, what would you cover now? Knowing what you know, what you've learned since it went to publication. Tiny habits for kids. Ooh. Tiny habits for kids. Ooh. And, you know, they're, well, and then I'm split, like, I'm split in two ways. I have to admit, tiny habits for kids, but also the book, even though it's been recognized, it's like best bu- business book of the year in a few ways. It wasn't written to be a business book, but yes, thank you editors and people who selected it because <laughs> it's very, very sure. helpful in business. Yeah. Um, but there'd probably be, and there is a chapter you can get on, there's a special business chapter. It's, you can find how to get it in the book. But I think I'm torn between the business and the kids. I would actually choose kids because um, we've started doing um, a special community called Tiny Habits for Kids. It's really for parents and teachers and coaches mm. who want to help kids create habits. And we're building that community. And that's just going really well. And the stories, oh, wow. I was reading one last night and she was talking about her daughter that had some physical disabilities and they were doing the stuff in the Tiny Habits book and they're reading it together. And they had a transformative experience in understanding. She had a, understanding her child better and how to help her better and how to help her move forward uh, despite her challenges. So I just think there's just so much need out there. So if I have to trade off business for kids, I think my heart would probably go to Tiny Habits for Kids. So we are investing that way. And that would be the chapter that I would add, but maybe coming soon to a bookstore near you or an online retailer is a book along those lines. Beautiful. Well, we can look forward to that. So I love that because you think of the cumulative effect, the compounding effect, if you will, of someone, our daughter's a fifth grade teacher. So the impact that she has on these kids at age, you know, 10, 11, nine, somewhere in there, it's, it's life change. Like she is impacting their lives because she's catching them so early. And you're saying the same thing as you help them make those changes at age 10, at age 12, at 15, that, 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 the cumulative effect is so huge. You know, yes, exactly. And in one of my, so within this community and it's not Facebook, we put it on a private platform. It's not Facebook people because I don't love Facebook at all. <laughs> Um, sorry, Facebook people. Um, one of the, so we have a section in there called moonshots, which is like, where do we go with this? Right. And, uh, one of the moonshots I posted was, I would love to see kids around the world. And I think in this context, I said the U S, um, I can't remember anyway, kids fourth or fifth grade, learn how to use celebration in their life. And they don't even have to learn how to create the recipes, just teach them to self-reinforce in a positive way and have them apply it. Because like you, you, you were saying, you're exactly right. Think how, think of the multiplier of that. Think how powerful that is where they could do it as you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, through the very difficult junior high years, through high school and so on. So the moonshot I wanted to share with my coaches and the parents and teachers on the platform is wow, I, I don't see me doing this, but maybe by me articulating it, somebody go, huh, right. I know how to bring it into my school or my district right. or what have you. Right. I, I think of the tiny habits method, that's probably the most important thing for kids to learn. And another story from this community is for parents and kids to understand and help each other to mm. celebrate the other person. Yes, huge. Like, yeah, right. Huge. And there were, in writing the book, you know, all the stories in the book are true. They have to be true because I'm a scientist. And I guess a lot of people do composite stories, but I was like, no, every story has to be 100% true. There were a lot of stories about moms whose 
like two and three year olds would celebrate the mom doing squats or wiping the kitchen. It's counter. huge. Yes. I never expected that. And really? I didn't know that in the early years of teaching this, but the kids kind of tune in and they celebrate their mom and the moms are like, oh my gosh, this is like a, this helped the habit wire in amazingly. And my kid is seeing, oh, how would they say it? Like they're seeing the example of me changing and I'm hoping that it helps my kids see that they can do this too kind of thing. Like they're, they're being the role model. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will tell you as the dad of three adult kids now, there's almost, besides my wife, there's no one I would rather have say, dad, that was cool or that was good or I'm proud of you or whatever. No one in the entire world than those three kids. So that even as adult kids, it's super powerful, but it was true as they were growing up. It, it was just, it's, it's who you want to be. They want, you want to be a better person as they encourage you to take those steps. So yeah, absolutely. And it, def and it definitely goes the other way, yeah. for sure. I mean, oh. Everybody's been there when the baby's taking the first steps. Guess what the parents are doing? <laughs> ah, right? I don't think that's an accident. Right. I think we are hardwired as human beings to reinforce our kids by helping them feel a positive emotion. So the act of taking steps wires in, and when they tumble, they're motivated to get back up. And there's other stories I could go into along those lines. I'm sure everybody listening to this can think of times in their life where somebody celebrated them yeah. and it may it helped them go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm going to do this again, right? Yeah. So I, I think, it, you know, there's two functions. One is to help, you know, it's, it's the brain chemicals, it's the dopamine release, which then changes the structure of the brain and sure. makes the behavior more automatic. But the other purpose I don't talk about a lot because I don't want to get people distracted off the most important point that emotions create habits is the motivational impact of, you know, that good feeling. You want to have that again. And that want is a type of motivation. So you'll seek to do that behavior again. Right. Now, again, this happens with bad habits. Negative. Yeah, Look exactly. And, see how, and so think of bad habits like weeds, weeds and plants grow from the same things. Right. Some we call plants, some we call weeds. So um, recognize that the habits you have in your life that you consider bad habits, they started small, they found a good spot, and then they were reinforced through an emotion that you had when you did the habit the first time, the second time, and so on. Right, right. All right, I've just got one more question for you, but let's find out how people can follow you, keep up with what you're doing, best website, Twitter, any of those kinds of things that you, you'd like to have them go to. Yeah, two things. Um, well, I'm BJ Fogg on all platforms. BJ okay. Fogg on Twitter, YouTube, BJ Fogg on Facebook, but there's no use doing that. BJ Fogg on LinkedIn, things like that. Um, and then websites, bjfogg.com and tinyhabits.com. Perfect. And the last question, uh, do you have an area of your own life where you're applying the tiny habit strategies right now where you wouldn't mind pulling the curtain back for us a little bit and saying, okay. Yes. You know, I always goof around with my behavior. And so I'm always creating habits and just toying around. Um, but one, you know, we're speaking now during the pandemic and, you know, one of my concerns is about my parents and how they're doing. Yeah. And they're quite isolated. Um, so what I started doing was, you know, I created the tiny habit recipe. After I, so this is after I surf in the mornings, I pull onto the road coming back home. So after I get on the road, I will call my parents. And at the beginning of that, I thought, well, you know, I've called my parents maybe a couple of times a week, but now it's every day. And I didn't, and it totally worked and now it's kind of built into their schedules as well and the overall impact of that is much bigger than i expected in terms of me feeling like i'm helping them during this important time or difficult time in terms of me understanding what their issues are me being able to follow up like how'd this go how'd that go you know how this you know my mom had eye surgery things like that and then there you know the surprise is how much how welcome my phone calls were I right. guess I didn't realize it would be. And then also how much they're actually really interested in the nitty gritty and even boring, boring things of my life. And that's just terrific. So just, you know, rather than just thinking, Oh, I should call my parents more. 
or it'd be nice to be understand how my parents are doing, just turn it into a habit and yeah. do it. Yeah. And I'll give another simple example. Um, this whiteboard I have behind me, it's, a, it's actually a screen and it's the backside of the screen. And I'd write on this and when the ink dries, it's very hard to get off. So it was just last week and I'd have to go to my partner who's really good at cleaning and say, Denny, can you make my black white again? <laughs> Which is lame, right? Because I didn't want to be dependent on him. And, you know, so what I realized is if I erase it right away, I think this is wet enough, then I can do it myself. So now the habit is as soon as I'm done teaching, and I teach, this is my Zoom room, I have a room set up for sure. Zoom. As soon as I turn off the camera and turn off the light, after I turn off the light, I erase the board. Now, I know that sounds kind of small and obvious, but I had not wired it in as a habit over the months and months. Now that it's a habit, I feel like I'm more in control of the space where I used to teach and share. And it's simple, but it ends up being not life changing, but it just it, it, it just yeah. helps me. No, that's a great example. Frustrated. Yeah. 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 That's beautiful. Great stuff. Thanks for pulling the curtain back for us. Dr. Fogg, this was awesome. Thank you for doing this. We've been talking about this for, uh, again, almost two years now. Really appreciate you making this happen with your schedule and very valuable time. Well, thank you. Terrific questions. And hey, everybody, we can help people be happier and healthier. And let's do it in the best way, in the most life-affirming, positive way. And we help people change by feeling good. So let's, let's do it. I'm here to help you help others. So everybody feel free to call on me, dive into tiny habits and behavior design, and let's help people you know, stop the culture of shame and trash talk and guilt and move to one of shine and happiness and then that radiates to other people. That's what my research shows. When people yeah. feel successful in creating these habits, then there's ripple effects out. And I think we can do that. And that's kind of what we're all here for. That's so, pretty cool. Let's go off and do awesome things. I love it. The one and only Dr. BJ Fogg, everyone. What a privilege. We do have a video version of this. If you want to go over to the YouTube coaching channel and check that out, he recorded it from his remote office in Hawaii. And it looked like a pretty nice setup. Again, his book is titled Tiny Habits, The Small Changes That Change Everything. Thanks for tuning in to the number one podcast for health and wellness coaching. Next week's episode is for all of you who always dreamed of being a superhero. We welcome Dr. Janita Scarlett, creator of Superhero Therapy. She'll help us tap into a new story about our lives that can make all the difference, no matter where we're coming from. As always, feel free to reach out to us with any questions about your current or future coaching career results at CatalystCoachingInstitute.com or tap into additional health, wellness, and performance coaching resources at CatalystCoachingInstitute.com. Now it's time to be a Catalyst, making a positive difference in the lives of our family, our friends, our clients, and our community without burning ourselves out in the process. This is Dr. Bradford Cooper, the Catalyst Coaching Institute. I will speak with you soon on another episode of the Catalyst Health wellness and performance coaching podcast, or maybe over on the YouTube coaching channel.